Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, November 8th. Today's topic is our featured teacher for the month and our special guest is Jamie Reynolds. I'm one of the show hosts, Lori Moffat, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning today. I'll ask the newbie question of Jamie and then either Peggy or Wes will introduce Jamie. The newbie question is this, what does Web 2.0 mean to you and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your library? Well, I've been thinking a lot about this question and I think basically what Web 2.0 means to me is that suddenly we have, we all have access to powerful technology tools where, you know, in years past it might have been kept in a special room or somebody had special access to those tools, whereas now we all have access. And I use them in my library uh, because, number one, the students love them. Number two, they are helping to prepare students for their future and for using 21st century skills. And it's also a great way for me to make um, collaborative relationships and connections with the teachers in our building. Okay, Wes, you have the mic. You may do the intro. All right. Well, thank you all, and hello from uh, Miami, Florida. I'm excited to get to, to join to uh, introduce Jamie. Um, you know, when when you are teaching anyone, whether adult or student, um, it, it doesn't happen that often, uh, or, or I don't know, maybe it does for other people, but it hasn't for me nearly as much where you uh, you just so soon after a class see a student you know, take off and fly. And I would say that Jamie Reynolds is, is that way. We had an opportunity, I guess, about two years ago to do some classes together over video conference and web uh, from Oklahoma to Montana on mapping media. And it has been so exciting to see Jamie work with her teachers and her students to publish work, to make narrated slideshows, to create all kinds of media to help students uh, show what they know and what they can do, and uh, I'm I'm beside myself with happiness to, um, you know, not only see that, but then um, see Jamie having this opportunity to share with you all what she's done, how she's done it, and what the results have been. So, without further ado, here's Jamie. Wow. Well, thank you, Wes, for that great introduction. I appreciate it a lot. I'm just going to advance my slides here real quick. So the first thing I want to do today, obviously, is to thank Tammy and Peggy and Lori for all the work you do to put this show together. And Peggy, thank you very much for working with me this week to get everything ready to go. That was great. And Wes, thank you for logging in from Miami to introduce me. Uh, today I want to talk about ways that I'm weaving technology into my curriculum in the library and also ways that I can weave that in to help me create collaborative relationships with the teachers in my building. And when we do that, like I said in my um, title here, when we put teacher librarians and teachers and technology together, we have a very powerful combination. That doesn't mean we always have to be working together, but when we open up that communication and we work together on some projects, then things are better for the students. We learn from each other and, and it, it's just a great win-win situation. Um, as Wes said, a lot of the things I'm going to be showing you today are things that I actually learned from him, and I'm showing you how I'm using them in the library. So I hope it's enjoyable. I think in order for me to kind of help you understand how much I love technology, I want to just tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I learned keyboarding on an electric typewriter and a computer. I graduated from high school in 1994, so my first keyboarding class, I was a freshman in high school, and we had enough computers that we could do the electric typewriter one week and then move to switch and use the computer the next week. And I absolutely loved my time on the computer. And during that time, <coughs> I um, really realized that I wanted to take as many computer classes as I could throughout my high school career. I thought there was nothing better than being able to edit my work and print it out on a dot matrix printer. If you remember those, those were <laughs> pretty amazing for the time. I would love to see a student today having to wait for a dot matrix printer to get their work. But basically, I 
I went from high school into college and I became a business ed teacher. That I studied that in college and I taught right away um, in a large district in North Idaho for three years. And I loved my classroom. I loved the connections I had with kids. And I especially loved, too, that I had access to technology. Uh, unlike now, where everyone has tech, you know, back then in the, in the middle to late 90s, not everybody had access to technology. So it was special to have that. Um, I met my husband. And that took me from a larger North Idaho area to a small, tiny town of 400 or 500 people in southwestern Montana, and there were no business ed positions when I came here. So I picked up my library minor and worked at the college for a year in a secretarial type position. Missed my classroom so much, but then I was able to, the job opened at Twin Bridges, and I was able to, I luckily got that job, and here I am today. I think back to my first couple years in the library, and I feel sorry for any fourth, fifth, or sixth grader that had me during those first couple of years because I imagine my library class was extremely boring. And I was trying to find my way. I didn't have a lot of technology in my library at all. I had three dilapidated computers. And not a lot of people were using the library. And I really missed my students. I missed my connections that I had with teachers and that kind of camaraderie you share when you know teachers share amongst each other. And I didn't feel like I was one of them right then. And I think it's very true that technology helped me to find my way to that place, the place where I am now. So I'm very thankful for that. So um, I, think, I think what I realized along the way was that teacher librarians, we have a unique ability to influence change in our schools. And especially when we can create great relationships with the teachers, that's when we have that power. And over the last few years, I have become a lover of Twitter, and I like to follow people on blogs, and I have gone to a lot of professional development. And when we do those things, we have a lot of, we find a lot of inspiration, lots of things we want to do. In fact, when I took Wes's first class, all I had at that time was my own iPad. And I, was, I started using my own iPad with the students in the library, and that's when I really realized that a lot of the tools I had used in my technology master's, I, I do have a master's degree in technology. I got that in about 2011. Um, a lot of those tools that I was using that were Web 2.0 on their own, like Glogster or Wikis, sometimes we would have um, problems with them. I still use some of those, but, but we would run into some glitches along the way with cookie settings or privacy set, whatever. We had difficulties. And basically, um, when I got the iPad in my hands, I realized that the iPad combined with computers was where the real power was, because between the two of them, we could accomplish a lot. So, but I would also be frustrated, because I thought, I only have my own personal iPad. I don't have enough technology. At that time, I have, well, and I still do. I have 20 computers in the library, and I now have um, a couple of Chromebooks. And I've had to get creative. Another teacher on staff and I, we got creative. She's another teacher who took Wes's class, too. And we started looking for funding. And I was able to get, over the course of a year and a half, 10 iPads in the library. And we were able to get three iPads in her classroom with a little small grant from a local power company from Northwestern Energy. So we're, we're getting those in there. And I think the reality is we don't need to have a one-to-one -one environment. That would be lovely. But the reality is, even if we don't have a one-to-one -one environment, we can still do really cool things with kids. And especially all of you teachers out there, if you just knock on the door of your librarian and ask them to help you along the way, most of them would be more than glad to do that. And they, they may just be a little afraid to approach you, too. It depends on the type of librarian you have at your school. So my advice is, uh, regardless of where you are with technology, start where you are and use what you have. And that will provide you with your map to where you want to go and also be looking for that unused technology in your building. I don't know how many teachers I've met in the last few years that have a cart of iPads or access to that. And they don't know, they're, they're not using them. Nobody's using them. And so find your way to that cart or that, that unused technology in your school and use it. So I talked about how my library was an empty place and how I had to make it a busy place. And making it a busy place really did come with technology. Um, of course, I want children reading wonderful books, and I want them coming in to do that. But in order to get them in the door, there's other things that have to be going on. I think 
our most important thing we can do as librarians is to make uh, teachers and students love the library. We want the library to be a place that people want to come to. And regardless of our schedule, we need to find ways to make that work. So for me, my schedule is a fixed schedule. So I'm definitely that prep person. Um, I teach students for 45 to 55 minutes. I see each class every week. And I'm lucky. I'm a K-12 full-time librarian. So I have some time during the day where I'm not teaching. And I can do some planning. And I know that's not the case for every librarian out there. Uh, I do. Uh, add some flexible scheduling as often as I possibly can. I love to flexibly schedule with the elementary teachers and high school teachers if they'll schedule with me too. I just have had more success so far with elementary, but I'm working my way into those older classrooms. Um, so what, when I have the flexible scheduling, that might mean that I'm meeting with the second grade teacher or the first grade teacher or whoever, and we're working on a project together. So we're adding a lot of extra time together in the library because we have a lot of space to work and we have the technology. Um, and then there can be some in-between time, too. So for example, if I'm working on my own project with the students, which I do a lot of on my own projects, too, uh, I can ask for extra time from the teachers when we're finishing up a project. I can say, hey, can I have an extra half an hour to an hour this week with your kids? And most of the time, they're really great about letting me have those kids to finish up a project. So obviously, the, to me, the best part of my job is the connections I make with students and teachers. And no longer is my library a quiet place. It's a very busy place. And I feel extremely lucky that I get to follow some of these children from the time they're in kindergarten clear to when they're in 10th or 12th grade. I keep track of my day with Google Calendar. I put a picture of that there just to say that's how I keep track. I keep track of where the iPads are going that day and everything that's going on goes there and it's live and I store that on my library web page so that teachers and others can see what's, what's happening in the library. I think that's very important to show that your library is a busy place. Uh, in order to do a lot of these things, um, we need to develop our professional learning network. And that can be people in your staff, people on Twitter, people through blogs, people in professional development classes that you've taken, and then use those people. Because sometimes when we're trying to find those teachers who will work with us, uh, we can have some times where we feel we approach a teacher and it doesn't go well, possibly. And we need to find people who will work with us. So find the teachers who will. And find people in your professional learning network who will. And that would work. That works great. My slide just slid over. Sorry about that. Here we go. OK, so once we have that technology, I think it's really important when we're talking about apps. I've seen over the years, just so, or just the last couple of years, so many apps and so many Web 2.0 tools. And there's so many that it can boggle your mind. And I think it's important to pick some and use them with meaning and purpose for what you're doing. Use them to uh, enrich what you already teach in your classrooms and, and integrate them well. So that's not to say that we can't find new apps and try new things. I definitely think we should. But I think when we give the kids a chance to use an app or a Web 2.0 tool on multiple occasions for possibly different reasons that we're using them, they get better at using them. They start teaching each other and helping each other. It's a great way to differentiate in your classroom or the library because it allows the kids who can go farther with the app to go farther. And then it also allows those kids who are struggling a little bit more to still produce something that is valuable and that they're proud of. And I think it also, when we're using these apps and allow them to really get in depth with them, they can, it prepares them better for their technology skills. They have a better chance to take control of of their learning. I love this picture here. And I put it in because it really shows what happened with our first graders last year in KidBlog. And I'll be talking about KidBlog in a few minutes. But these kiddos had been using KidBlog for at least half of the year when we stood back and took a picture of them. The first grade teacher, Mrs. Payton, and I, and I think she's actually listening in today. Um, her kids were getting up and moving around spontaneously with no instruction from us helping each other, sharing ideas, showing each other how to change a font or add something to their blog, and then going back to work. This was not a classroom management issue. This was little people becoming teachers you know, and becoming helpers. And that was where we experienced the real power of, wow, you know, there are times when we're doing kid blog at first, and they're all logging in. And it's Mrs. Payton, Mrs. Payton, Mrs. Reynolds, Mrs. Reynolds. 
um, you might feel a little like you want to tear your hair out at times like that. But that first five minutes or those first few times are so worth it because when they really learn how to use the tool, amazing, amazing things happen, even with little first graders. So I also think when we're using technology, obviously we'll be using it uh, to consume. And there's lots of fun things we can do at that lower end of our thinking skills at the lower end of Bloom's taxonomy, things like re remembering and applying and understanding. And that's great. And we need to be doing that. It's a great way to remember math facts and practice spelling and sounds and practice our reading. And, but on the other end, we want to get to that higher order of thinking, the higher order of thinking skills. And we want to get to that creation place. And I believe when we get to creation, that's where we automatically see, especially with technology, we automatically see analyzing and evaluating taking place. I've noticed that um, I can hand a paper back to kids and try to get them to evaluate it or analyze it. And sometimes there are, are kids who just, they don't want to look at that paper ever again. But they certainly want to look at their um, very cool tech presentation that they made over and over again. And when they do that, they automatically start critiquing themselves and thinking of what could I do next to make it better. And so they are there. They're way up there on their thinking skills. And I, I love that part of what technology does for us when we pair it with our curriculum. So be thinking, be thinking of that. You know, when students, when students publish their work too, when, they, when we're able to create something and share it, and I'll be talking about sharing today too, and sharing is a very important part of doing these things. It doesn't do us all, it's great for the kids to do them, but we definitely want to share them out into the world. When they know they're sharing, it has a huge impact on those higher order thinking skills because they want, they have a, more of a drive to create something more special and meaningful, and they evaluate themselves and critique themselves even more so in those cases. And I, I love that, that part of it too. I've had kids just sit and work and work and work just to make it as perfect as they can. It's really funny. So today I want, the first app I want to talk about is EduCreations, and it is an interactive whiteboard app. And I was happy to see that some of you actually hadn't used it, so I, you might be learning something new today, or maybe you've heard of EduCreations, and this might help you have the push to go ahead and try it. I'll be talking about a couple of whiteboard applications, and I just, I really like them, and that's why I'm talking about both of them today. Educrations is probably my favorite because it's free, and it is very easy to use. So it's very easy to put in little kids' hands, and that, that's very nice. It's free up to 50 megabytes, and they actually host your information and your projects for you on their site, and then all you have to do is make a link to where you're sharing it and hook it onto the picture, and you've created your, your method of sharing with the world. And that's a really great way um, to share student learning, and like Wes said, to show what they know. Uh, it can be used on a PC or an iPad. And the best part about it is that it records voices. So we can hear little kids and big kids' voices. And so what we like to do is, I'm just going to give you some examples of how we use it. I know there are teachers out there that do use this for um, sub plans. For example, they might. Uh, do a math lesson and leave it for their sub to play. And you can actually talk and write at the same time in these apps, so in this app. So it's nice because they have, can actively see what's going on when the teacher's explaining a math concept or whatever they're explaining. I think it would be cool. I've been trying to talk some teachers into doing this to have a math help channel on educations or a math help, I don't know, something in each class where a student records a math problem they're working on each week and explains how to do it. I would love that as a parent in fourth grade math, actually, to have that at home. So on the right, what you see here, uh, at the top, you see a wolf. And my third graders actually completed this project just this week. We have been studying the three little pigs. And we read three versions. We read the original version. We read um, the three ninja pigs. And we read the true story of the three little pigs. And each week when we read one in library class, I had them evaluate the characters and the setting. And we picked words that you know, describe the characters. And then at the end, I asked them to form an opinion, which I think forming an opinion is, is fairly easy by third grade level for kids to do. But they have a very difficult time backing up their opinion. And that's what I really wanted to see them do. So they had to pick their favorite version. And then they had to choose the character that they thought was the strongest or the character that they believed the most in the case of the true story of the three little pigs. 
because that's the wolf's um, side of the story. And then they had to say why they thought so, and they had to support it with reasons from the book. OK, because I think that support value is something that they're missing sometimes. And then when they finished that, they illustrated it. And I just gave them a paper that helped them scaffold their ideas. And then uh, this week in class, I gave them the iPads. And they took their own picture of their uh, illustration. And then they went in the other room on their own or in pairs and helped each other out. And they recorded what they wanted to say about their opinion about the book. And I did encourage the kids to speak freely without reading off of their paper. But I also told them if they needed to read off their paper, they could. And I had about half and half. The thing I like about that, though, is when we play that back next week in class on the overhead and we, we listen to them and watch them, there will be automatic evaluating happening. Kids will be thinking, oh, I wish I would have said that, or I wish I would have done that. And they'll be more prepared for the next project that we do, regardless of the technology tool we're using. The second one you see here is a whole class project that Mrs. Payton and I did together in first grade this year. We, I read The Day the Crayons Quit to the first graders in, I think, late September. Love that book. And then I had them write a little response back to a crayon in their desk or to all of their crayons. I had them think about which crayon they use the most and which one they don't use enough of. And they had to pick whether they wanted to write a thank you letter to their crayon, or I'm sorry, and we got all kinds of letters. They were very cute. And then um, Mrs. Payton jumped in with me, and we had them illustrate you know, a picture that, that helped them kind of show what they wrote. And then we used Educreations to have them say their letter into uh, the Educreations app on top of their picture. So and then we put that all together. So it's about a 2 minute and 43 second uh, slideshow, I think. And it's really fun, and the kids love to listen to themselves. And again, hearing themselves back, you know, you get to those speaking and listening skills, part of the common core. And you know, you're meeting your content standards at the same time that you're meeting some of those technology standards. And these are just great tools to use for that. So another whiteboard app I want to talk about is Explain Everything. And the reason is, is this could be something if you're in an older in a classroom with older students, this might be something you find would be better for you. It's also an interactive whiteboard app. It's $2.99 on the iPad. I think last I checked, that's what it was. And the nice thing about it is when you're done with a project, you can actually upload it to YouTube, whereas um, with EduCreations, you have to subscribe to the professional version in order to upload to YouTube. So these are you know, the pros and cons. Uh, the con to explain everything is because it's more robust, it's a little bit more difficult to use. So to me, I don't think, it, for me personally, a kindergartner or a first grader would have an easy of a time using it on their own as they do Educreations. And also with Explain Everything, you can save drafts you know, and come back and work the next day, come back and work the next week. Whereas in Explain Everything, you have to have, in order to save multiple drafts, you can only save one at a time on the free version. But multiple drafts, you have to have the professional version of of um, education. So there are some differences. But what I did with, again, with making your content fun, we have to teach the content. We want to teach the content. And I think it's very important for kids to know how to use their library. We, you know, we still have books. They're still here. And I want kids to be able to know how to get to them. So in third grade, we really focus about halfway through the year on how to get from the catalog to the shelf. How do I find the books I'm interested in and get to them? And we focus on that for a few weeks. And last year, I thought, oh, I'm going to use Explain Everything and have them do a tutorial for how to do this. And then I'm going to post it to my library web page. And then other people can learn, too. So what we did is we, I demonstrated to them as a class. And we created one as a class. We brainstormed and came up idea, with ideas. We planned it out. And we created it on the board. Then I gave the kids some storyboarding materials. And they wrote their script of how they wanted to teach people to use the book, to use the catalog, what book they would um, model finding, and then what pictures they wanted to go with that. They had to learn, obviously, how to take um, a picture if they didn't know how. And they also had to learn how to take screenshots. Once they had that all done, and they'd taken their pictures and had their plan, they put it together. It took us probably two or three sessions to get these recorded. And I did pair them up so they had a helper during their recording. And I think a couple of them did this in pairs as well. And it's, a, it's kind of a small class. I think there's only 14 kids in that class. So when they were finished, we had these amazing little productions. And 
if you li ever listen to any of them, it's amazing to hear their voices. There was one little group that recorded over and over again, and when you listen to this little gal's voice, you can really hear uh, her persuasion that she's giving there. She's, she's trying to t convince people that you should definitely use the library catalog. This is where it's at. You know, it's so exciting, and it's just really fun to listen to their personalities come out when they're doing these tutorials. They're still very proud of them to this day, and it's a clear year, almost a year later. Okay, so another thing that I used last year with the students, and this was a direct result of a class I was taking with Wes at the time, was to use iMovie, and I also gave the kids a choice to use Animoto, and I will be using these again and again because the kids absolutely love using them. Um, Animoto and iMovie are just, you know, video editing programs that kids can put together a short commercials or slideshows or little movies. And what I did last year is I had the kids create book trailers at the end of the year. So what I find oftentimes with my sixth graders at the end of the year is they're like little mini seniors. They kind of have sixth grade itis and I start to lose them during the fourth quarter. So I thought, oh, I will have them do these book trailers and maybe that will keep them engaged. So what we did was we watched several book trailers on YouTube and got some ideas and then I set them free on this little project. I gave them the storyboarding and encouraged them to come up with their own ideas, I encouraged them to pull a couple of quotes from the book they chose to do the trailer on, and they also had to choose whether they would use iMovie or Animoto. I love both programs. The, the nice thing about iMovie, though, is that it's free on the newer iPads, at least it was on the iPad Airs last year, and once you're done, you can upload to YouTube. So you always have it. Whereas um, Animoto is a subscription. It's not overly expensive. They have different levels. But uh, I, I found that it was difficult for the kids to be able to complete what they wanted to do with the free or the cheaper subscription. So that's just something you need to consider for yourself. So what I noticed while they were doing these, though, um, is just their drive to do a really great job. They were automatically driven to do that. They were engaged in the project. They were automatically evaluating, like I've talked about, and reflecting on how it could be better. And this was a great opportunity for, uh, sorry, opportunity for me to drive home the idea that all these things I've been teaching them, you know, we need to cite our sources, cite your sources. We need to try to create our own images. That's more powerful than just using someone else's and also throwing in that idea that, you know, a lot of images on the web are not just free for us to use. And I realize that happens sometimes, but it's very important to me as a librarian to point out to kids that we can't just go haphazardly using all of the images we find on the web. We certainly need to cite them, and it's even better if we can be using public domain or Creative Commons license images, and then it just kind of protects us. And it's just a good lesson for them to have before they fly the coop from library classes and move on to the next level. So, um, and you'll see down there on the right corner, these two girls, they were thinking, you know, at a higher level, how can we show an uprising? And they came up with the idea of taking pictures of their fists. I thought, that's fantastic. They created their own image to put in there, and a lot of kids did that. They went out and took pictures of the playground and different things. The thing to keep in mind here when you're doing these iMovies or Animoto is there's something that happens when we put pictures and music and words together. It evokes emotion. Any of you who've ever put together a slideshow of family or, or something special, and when you put music and words with your children or something important that's happened, you just, it's very emotional and you could see this in these kids, they were, they were emotional about this, they were so excited and like I said, it was extremely empowering, so I would highly suggest finding a use for these two apps if you could. I plan on doing another project here really soon with this year's sixth graders. If anybody has any ideas for me for a topic, let me know. Okay, so now I want to talk about kid blog. I'm going to talk about it for a little longer because it's become a big part of what we do. So in my first class with Wes, we used, in both classes, we used KidBlog to kind of curate all of our work. And as we were doing that and modeling ways that we could be using KidBlog in our classrooms, my mind was whirling. There were a couple other teachers in the class with me too, and I was thinking, how could I do this? How could I, how could I make KidBlog become a part of what we do at Twin Bridges School? 
and I thought, you know, I could do this in library, but I only see the kids once a week, and that would mean that we'd have to blog all the time, and then it would become more like a chore than kind of a gift, I guess, or a special thing. So I, I couldn't figure out how to do it, and then I was thinking, well, in a year from now, what will it look like? And I think we really need to think about that when we're setting up kid blog or any blogs, is what do you want it to look like a year from now? If you're setting it up in your classroom or you're setting it up in, you, you know, wherever you're setting it up, think about that, because that makes a big difference to your setup. So kid blog is free, and when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, again, how could I do this? And I finally came up with the idea of, I know, I could do it as class of 2021, class of 2022, class of 2023. And when I do that, then I can extend the invitation to all of the elementary teachers to use kid blog on their own or with me. I can extend the invitation to our elective teachers, you know, like myself for library or for art or music. And I can extend the invitation to our after school program, the 21st century program. So I thought this, this is a win-win all the way around and also it helps me get in and um, collaborate with teachers. It gives me a way to get in there and say, hey, do you want to do a blogging project or do you want to bring your kids in to blog? And it's just one more way that I can connect. Um, the nice thing about doing it the way I did it is that now we're using them again this year and it's funny when we brought several classes into blog, uh, most of them had the same response to me. They said, hey, no, we're in, we're in fourth grade now. We're not the class of 2023. We're in fourth grade, Mrs. Reynolds. And I, I said, I know, but you're always going to be the class of 2023. You know, that's the year you graduate from high school. I did that on purpose so you could keep all of your stuff. Well, the minute they realized that all their stuff was on there from last year, they were just, and they, they got to keep it. They were overjoyed and completely lost track of what we were doing and immediately wanted to go back and look at all of those things they had been doing the previous year and listen and see what they had said. And I think that right there shows that they have ownership of their blog and that they love doing it. So the nice thing about Kid Blog is it's very simple. It's a great way to teach kids how they can harness the power of the web and the power of writing. And it gives us the opportunity to teach them uh, internet safety skills and internet citizenship skills. So when they're commenting, for example, you know, that idea of, you know, don't just make boring comments, make comments that point to something. Be specific if you can and give a compliment, ask a question. How do we have a conversation? You know, is it better to ask open-ended or closed-ended questions? How can we generate that? And that's really great for them. So I just want to go over a couple of ways that we use Kid Blog because um, there are several ways to use it. And the first way is that we just use it to um, have kids just write freely. So we brought the first graders in at the beginning of this year and um, we just had them write a little bit about themselves. And I have to say, the first thing you notice when you ask the kids to do this at this age is they are paralyzed in fear of spelling something wrong. And you can see they're just stagnant. They cannot move forward because they need you to sit right by them and help them spell. The problem is you have 12 or 15 or 18 kids in there and you can't help every kid spell every word. So we have to really encourage inventive spelling and tell them it's okay, you know, this is where we're getting our voice out, we're expressing ourselves and as long as we know what you mean, it's okay because we know you're working on your spelling and we know we're working on this in class and you will get it. You will get it eventually. I think it's funny that we put so much pressure on kids to spell and, and to um, write correctly right from the get-go. And it was refreshing to see the answer today that most of you aren't afraid to put imperfect work out. But I, I've asked teachers this before. I asked this at a conference earlier this spring when I was presenting and over half the room raised their hand and said, yes, they, were, they did not like putting student work in the hallway or displaying it if it wasn't pretty much perfect. And I think that's really sad because if you think about the things that kids have to learn, we all had to learn along the way. We had to learn to walk and we had to learn to talk. We had to learn to possibly play a sport or to play an instrument. And I guarantee you it wasn't very pretty along the way. There were probably some quite messy, messy times and, and funny things that happened, but we were allowed to do it in public. We were allowed to walk in public and practice our sport in public regardless of how we looked. And we need to allow kids to practice writing in public. And I love what Wes said here. I found this, um, Mrs. Payton was talking about it from Montana Ed Chat. I missed the chat, but I grabbed this. And he just said a couple weeks ago, a focus on perfect writing leads students to shrink away from writing. I think, wow, Wes, what you said there is so impressive and true because 
this is exactly what we see. So we need lots of practice with just writing. And then we see their true voice. We see who they really are. When we look at this little boy Landon here, this is Landon in September of his first grade year. We're not, we're not, this isn't perfect Landon. This is, this is Landon who he is and I love it. Okay. Did I miss a slide there? Sorry. Okay, another way that we use the blogs is we add special items and just encourage commenting. So it doesn't always have to be about a post. It can be about, Mrs. Payton and I put this, our polar animal research that we did. We do a big polar animal research unit where they use online tools like World Book Online and they use um, other websites that are good for kids, like National Geographic for kids, and then we use books and they learn about their animal and then they write about their animal. It's a several step process and then they create a picture and then we just went ahead and scanned them and put them in the blog for them and then we encouraged commenting. We sent notes home to parents and we let everybody know to do this. And I love this one that Audrey did here. She got nine comments on her blog and I love when I read through them because her mom asked her some very interesting questions. Her mom said, um, she asked her how they eat and Audrey responded, I don't know, that sounds like a good question for World Book. So she was thinking of her resource and how she could find the answer, which I love for a first grader to think of that. And her mom also asked, how can you tell, they look so much like a penguin, how can you tell a penguin and a mer, and a mer I don't even know how to say it, apart? Her mom also said that, she said, how do you pronounce that? And Audrey explained which one lived in Antarctica and which one lived in the Arctic. And I just thought that was amazing. That showed Audrey's learning. She showed what she learned and that's extremely important. And I also think when they see these and they can see other kids and they see um, how there's look, again, we're back to that whole self-evaluation and reflection. How can I do better the next time? What can I do to get my mom to talk to me the next time on my blog? And also it just develops really great conversational skills. So um, another thing we can do with the blogs is just encourage curiosity. A great thing to do is before you start a unit or in the middle of a unit, let kids uh, blog their questions out there to the world. And the more we have uh, people using our blogs and responding back to our blogs, the kids are going to find that they can find answers this way. And this little, this little boy asked, I wonder if pumpkins are, are yellow? And that's a great question to start the pumpkin unit art. Can pumpkins be yellow? And the nice thing is, is one of our administrators answered him, as you can see. So it's great to get other people involved in the blog. Involve your administrators, involve parents by sending notes home. You know, get it in the newsletter. Get your community involved. Use Twitter to get people, other classrooms involved. This is my plug out there. If you guys, if anybody out there wants to blog with Twinbridge's school, please let, my, let me know. Email me, contact me on Twitter, and I would love to connect my classes with your classes or some of our elementary classes with your classes. Let's do that. The other nice thing about doing this is it helps share the load because when we're working so hard as teachers to make kid blog and educations and all of these things work, sometimes there's not as much time for us to go in and comment every single time on every single child's blog, but we want them to have comments. And so this helps when we kind of spread it out a little bit and they get comments from different people besides just us too. That makes it a better experience for them. When we, um, another, sorry, another thing that we can do is we can assign a topic. So I, I, like to, I still like to involve choice when I'm assigning that topic, but one that I did this year, uh, and I did it last year too, is I have fourth graders write a book review. And when they write that book review, uh, I give them a little bit of scaffolding up front and say, you know, I want you to have an introduction paragraph, I want you to talk about setting, characters, um, I want you to tell me your favorite part, and I want you to have a conclusion. You know, I want it to flow a little bit. That's pretty much the scaffolding I give them. And then they did their writing on paper, and we did some peer editing, and we also did, I, I went through and did a little tiny bit of editing. Not much, just made some pointers on the handwritten portion. And I want to point out, you know, this other quote that I pulled from Wes, thank you Wes for these great quotes. If we edit student work to the point where it is perfect because of our changes, it is no longer their work. This is so, so, so important. We need this to reflect that this is a fourth grader's work. This is what this fourth grader can do. This is a real picture. And um, it's great to keep in mind as we're doing these things. So age appropriate editing, I would say. It's important to learn the editing process, but don't, don't overdo it, especially on the blogs. Um, so then I have the kids uh, 
illustrate it. And I, I went ahead and scanned their pictures for them in the office and loaded them on the T drive, one of our drives on the server. And then they had the opportunity to go in and just type their blogs. I didn't do any editing on their blogs. It's their work. And they had to locate and access their pictures on the, on the server and bring them in. And we also worked with QR codes on this. I had them create a kind of an advertisement, you know, read my book review, or read my book review on the Spiderwood Chronicles, and then I had them generate a QR code. So they had to work with URLs, and they copied and pasted their generated QR code into their little advertisement, and we posted those in the hallway by um, their pictures during parent-teacher conferences, because, and they, and they thought it was so fun to work with QR codes. We hadn't done that before, and they, um, they see them on cereal boxes and all sorts of things, and suddenly they got to create one. They thought that was really fun. I just want to point out that some of the best things about doing kid blog is uh, the kids get to write for a genuine audience. And again, when they're writing for an audience and it's something beyond just their teacher, I think when kids write just for their teacher and they know only my teacher is going to see this or only my teacher and maybe my parents are going to see this and it's just going to go in their backpack, um, it, it doesn't always have the same power that it has when they can be writing for an audience. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, they do take pride and take over ownership of their blogs if we do it right. And what I notice is a lot of kids that really need that, uh, I guess that stimulation from the blog or that feeling of, of participating in something bigger, they write from home all the time. They're always on there commenting at home or some of them even write their own posts from home. And it's just amazing to see some of the connections that happen on the blogs. We've had grandparents connect with their kids, with their little kids from afar. We've had parents who are separated and, you know, mom or dad lives in a different state and they, they can still participate with their student who's learning and they can um, add comments and see what their student is doing. It's just very, very powerful. Last year when we did the blogs, Jim Benton himself, actually I, I reached out to him on Twitter and told them that one of the students had written a review on Franny K. Stein. My kids love Franny K. Stein books at about the third or fourth grade level. And he actually went into that student's blog and wrote to him and told them that he loved his picture and loved what he wrote. And that was extremely powerful for that student. So you have to think that these can go way beyond the walls of just your school. I think it's important to remember to add the fun stuff. So when we are doing these, don't forget to add, you know, some of the fun things you're doing. Maybe it's an audio boom, which is kind of like a little radio broadcast app, or poplets, which are organizational visual thinking tools, and they're really neat looking. And you can, we have a teacher who uses them a lot for science, and they put them in their blogs. Book Creator, you could create books and, and put the link to that in there. There's so many things. Little Bird Tales is another. Uh, whiteboard app that I've used before and I really like it. Um, it's a little bit, it's more geared for little kids and it's also, um, it's free and then parents can buy the production for 99 cents when it's done. So that's kind of a neat aspect of Little Bird Tales. But put that stuff in there. I want to talk a little bit about this project here that Mrs. Payton did this year. She, uh, at conference, she learned about Vokey. I have learned about Vokey in the past but I've never used it and so she saw that and thought, that is so fun. My first graders will love that. She came to me and she said, I, I really want to do this. Um, I want to do it with a pumpkin. What book could we do? So we went and we found a book that would work and we found The Fierce Yellow Pumpkin by Margaret Wise Brown and she took it and read it. I was really busy doing some things in the library and she took that end of it, which is the best part of collaboration when you find those teachers you can work with is you can, you know, play off of each other and you both, one of you has time to do something and the other one has time to do something and you get together and you make it work and it's great. So we read The First Yellow Pumpkin and she, there's a chant in there that says, ho, 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 he, 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 mice will run when they see me. And so we used that chant that was said over and over again by The First Yellow Pumpkin and we had the kids uh, fill in their own word. We created a little, kind of a little worksheet for them to fill in their own word to ho, 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 he, 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 mice will run when they see me, but instead of mice, they could put in, it was a blank, they could put in what they wanted. So we gave them that opportunity and then they all went in the office, with, in my library office with Mrs. Payton during library class and they recorded their Vokey. And Vokey, what it does is it syncs their voice to whatever picture. So there's all different avatars you can use and in this case she used a pumpkin, very appropriate for Halloween week in our story. And they recorded it and I think 
this was really fun. So then we, she embedded them into their blogs, and then we encouraged commenting on our next blogging session. The first graders come in and blog once a week on Mondays for half an hour. So the next time they came in to actually to blog and to comment, they couldn't function. All they could do was listen to their Vokies. They were so proud. They listened to their Vokies, got very little commenting done, and that was OK. It was Halloween week, and they were proud of what they had done. Uh, and then Mrs. Payton took them back to class, and they had a little bit of reflection time, first grade reflection time. And she asked them what they might have done differently, or what they wish they would have done, or what they might do differently next time. And she had several students comment on the fact that they wished they hadn't said mice. They wished they had said cats or bats or something. And I found, she found that interesting. I found that interesting. I, because I think, and she pointed this out, sometimes some of our best students think they have to do everything perfect. You know, if I do it perfect, if I do it just like the book, then I've done a really good job. And they forget that just, they don't know how to step outside of that box and do something just a little different and show their voice. And so already at the first grade level, we had students saying, I wish I would have done this. And they're learning that it's OK to step outside and make those small changes and share their voice and their ideas, even in just something that small as doing that little fun vokey. So it's really important, and it's fun. And they'll, I guarantee they'll be watching those again and again over the years. So, and luckily for them, when they're in sixth grade, if they're still at Twinbridge School, they'll be able to go back to their first, they'll be still on the same blog. They'll be able to go back and listen to their work from first grade. And I love that. So I think it's so important to talk about sharing. That's where the power is in all of this. Obviously, there's power, yes, in the students creating these projects and in teachers working together. And that's what we really want. But when we share this, that's where the real power comes, because other people are seeing it and responding to it. And it's showing the kids that what you're seeing is important to this kind of global audience or bigger audience than just the audience within our school or within your classroom. What I've done in order to share is I've built a website for the library. And I'm sure some of you librarians listening today have a website. And if you don't, I highly encourage you to build one. Teachers listening today, if you have a school website or a library website where um, you would feel comfortable asking them to put your work on there, that would be a really great way to share some of the things you're doing beyond your classroom walls. You can also share you know, with email or notes or um, on the you know, monthly newsletter. Those are ways you can share. But we have to remember that suddenly these Web 2.0 tools and technology have made it so that no longer are these projects always stuck in the bottom of a backpack you know, and left there to be crumpled. They're archived and preserved for us to watch again and again and to respond to. So if, I guarantee you, though, if you build a website, um, people will come to it. And what I did in order to make that happen in the school library was I finally had a hard time deciding what to use to build my website. And I finally settled on Weebly. I needed something free. I do pay for a bigger version now. But I need something free and fairly easy to use and edit. I'm not a coder or writer of computer language. So I just needed to be able to basically drag and drop the things I wanted in there, be able to add hyperlinks, be able to embed things. I can handle it to that extent. I wanted it to be a place that felt like my library. I wanted it to be a place when people go to it at home or wherever they are that they felt like they were almost inside of my library. It's a place to celebrate student work. I often post student work on the front page there, and then I try to blog about it on my library blog, which is TB Library Connection, right next door to the home page on my website. I, it takes me longer to get the blogging done, though, because I, I do fall behind, I will admit it. I get it done, though. Um, and, and then I also put, I put my catalog there. I put all of our online subscription links there. I put links to my keyboard. I teach keyboarding a couple hours a week to third through sixth graders. And I put all of our links there for that. I put links to work cited help and research help for high school kids when I have them in for lessons on citations and things like that. So then what I did in our grading program, all of that's on there for teachers, too, access to email from home. And then what I did is I just started, anytime anybody asks me for any resource, oh, you go to tbschoollibrary.org, go to tbschoollibrary.org. And then the next thing you know, the, the kids are teaching their parents how to get to tbschoollibrary.org. They're teaching their teachers. And it's just a win-win. And we're all accessing our information from the same place. And we're seeing some of this great work that kids are doing. So I highly encourage you to 
find a place for everything, even if it's a you know a classroom blog or website, would be fantastic too. Just remember to think about how you want it to look a year from now. I think that's important. I think you know my final thoughts today uh, with this is to is to tell you to enrich what you're doing, enrich what you're already doing in your classrooms in your library. Just add you can add technology easily to do that. And as you're doing this, regardless of whether you're a pro or you're in the middle or you're a beginner, just start where you are and protect your inspiration. Look out there on Twitter. Look out there on blogs. Go to professional development. But remember that we, we are people who have probably families and we have to have a work-life work balance. And I think it's important to be proud of your efforts and be proud of what you have accomplished and follow through with what you're try trying to accomplish. We don't want to get half done projects and never complete. We want the kids to experience the completion and the sharing portion of that, that powerful portion. I think it's important to be brave. Uh, I will tell you that when I started my library website, it was very nerve wracking for me. I had to share, suddenly I had to share my voice and I had to go out there and share the things I was doing and the last thing I want people to think is that I'm saying, look how I do it. Look how I do it. That's not it at all. I, there are so many ways to do it. And we all need to do it our way. But still, no matter what, we have to be brave to do that. And it's OK to be imperfect. It's OK even for teachers and librarians to be imperfect. We are not perfect. We will make mistakes. And we can correct them. But it's important to get the information out there. And my final thought today is we have to remember to collaborate. If we collaborate with one another, we can do better things for our students. So I, I, I really believe that two teachers together working is, is like, is multiplied. It's like four teachers working together. It, it just it gives the best things to the students. So teachers, again, knock on the door of your librarian. And if your librarian's not willing to work with you or you don't have a librarian, find a teacher or a technology specialist in your school, one of those if you're lucky enough to have a school where you have technology integration specialists on your staff, use them. Get them to come in and help you. That's what they're there for. And they, they want to help you and bring them in. And teacher librarians listening, remember to go and try to get your foot in the door however you can with teachers. Um, find ways to strike up a conversation and begin having that collaboration uh, between the two of you and from that when you have successful collaboration at any level more will grow and from that others will come to you and they will they will seek you out so those are my thoughts today and I just want to say uh, thank you for this opportunity today and I'm, I'll stick around if there's any questions thank you so much Jamie I did thank you capture a few questions um, do your schools call your librarians teacher librarians? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> in the time since I started being a librarian, uh, in about 2002, I was first a media specialist, is what they called us. And then we became teacher librarians. Um, and I, I do like that term. I, I think when we switch back and forth all the time, people people still just like to call us librarians, and I'm fine with any of it mm -hmm. because I just see myself as an educator. I am on the education team in my school, and I just want to be seen that way. So it all works for mm -hmm. me. I think by the end of the presentation, you had answered this, uh, but early on, someone asked, "Where do you keep their finished projects?" The pics, the pictures and videos take up so much room. Yeah, they really do. And I think that's still a great question. I, I touched on it a little bit. But to be honest with you, my goal is obviously to keep it on KidBlog. We do pay for a KidBlog subscription mm -hmm. at this point so that we can store all of that. Um, it's $2 per student. So that's really affordable for our district. We're a small district. And you know, I think we have 110 kids in the entire elementary possibly, so that's very affordable for us to just keep paying for it. And we've done enough with it that the district sees it as, you know, a real benefit mm -hmm. and they're more than willing to pay for it. Um, again, with, with Weebly, I do pay a small fee every year now so that I can keep information on there. But you have a lot of that, a lot of the information on there is actually, we're not actually storing it, we're just storing links to mm -hmm. it. So it's actually linking out to another host site that's storing it, such as EduCreations or wherever. So we're not really storing it there. But I, I think it's really important, again, to find that one place or those two places 
I guess now between my TV school library uh, website and the um, kid blog, that's where it's all stored. Okay. Um, Jamie, do you post anything on your blogging site that lets viewers know that these are authentic writings and may include things that aren't perfect? I do. I actually, if you look on, I have a page called, um, on the front page of pbschoollibrary.org, there's a button that says, we are blogging. And I do, I, I did a write-up. Um, I really struggled with it last year because we have teachers who are afraid for their students. You know, I could be doing something in library class and I let the kids post it. And maybe that offends a teacher in the elementary because they're afraid that that's showing people that um, their students can't do great work or something. So there's, mm -hmm. that is a communication process between the librarian and the teacher if you're doing something like that. Uh, I still think it's important to get it out there and, and show their work. But so what I did to make everybody feel more comfortable is I did do a write-up and anyone's free to look at it to talk about that we do encourage kids to use inventive spelling and their work is not perfect and we send notes home too on their first blogging of the year to let them know to let the parents know, you know, remember to be patient with your child, they're learning and, and they are going to have misspellings and this is our goal. So we do try to communicate that out. Mm -hmm. Do you work at different sites or buildings or are you housed in one location? Do you have assistance on staff? I am so lucky that I'm in one building. So K-12, we're mm -hmm. in one building and we're in um, kind of a pieced together building. We got a new part a few years ago. And so the library isn't dead smack in the middle. Um, it's just the door mm -hmm. right in the middle between the high school and the elementary. And no, I have no staff. So um, mm -hmm. that is something I meant to talk about today. It's just me. I'm the cataloger. I'm, I try to get students to shelve my books. And uh, it's, it's overwhelming sometimes to try to do everything. And I can't do everything, but I try to do as much right. as I can. Sure. Uh, great. Those were the questions that I was able to catch from the chat. We'll go ahead and do the conclusion of today's show. Again, thanks so much, Jamie, for coming. Thank you, guys. Uh, this was just a really enjoyable experience. Thank you so much. So I'm going to jump on here and say thank you, thank you, thank you, Jamie. That was terrific. And even though you're a teacher librarian, all of those tips work for all of us, no matter what our setting is and what the age level of our students is. So thank you for all those great tips and tools and for your encouragement. You just make us all feel comfortable about moving ahead, and that's great. I um, want to let you know we have some other great shows coming up, so come back and join us whenever you can. Next week we're going to be featuring edweb.net, which is an incredible free platform for uh, webinars for teachers on lots of different topics. And Lisa Schmucky is bringing a team of educators with her to share their experiences using EdWeb for professional development, both personally and in their schools. And I know it's going to be great. On November 22nd, we're going to have a, a really special show with Lisa Thuman, who is an all-time guru for all things Google. And she's going to especially talk about Google Drive and Google Classroom. Then we won't have a show on Thanksgiving weekend. I know that everyone in the world doesn't celebrate Thanksgiving at that time, and that Canadians have already had their Thanksgiving. But that will be the US Thanksgiving. And then December 6th, we're really hoping to have an hour of coding show, because that is the week it kicks off. So we're still working on those details, but that's likely to happen. Steven Anderson is going to be back with us on December 13th and share this incredible free tool called ClassFlow. If you haven't discovered it, you're going to want to come and hear from him and see all the amazing things you can do with it as a teacher. 
<clears throat> then we'll take a winter break and we'll come back after that winter break on January 10th for our annual anniversary celebration. This will be our sixth anniversary. We are so excited to be celebrating six years of webinars with all of you. And we'll do a fun year of and review, we'll play some games, and we would love to have you come and, and join us. We'll be celebrating all of the people who have presented for us all year long. So join us if you can. Thanks, Peggy. Steve Hargadon's newest venture is the Learning Revolution Project, and that's what this slide is. Um, letting you all know about, he's gathered all his PD resources all in one place, as well as the host your own webinar, and that's significant because you can you can sign up for a free Blackboard Collaborate room and do your own webinar as long as you make the webinar public. You can nominate a featured teacher as Wes did when he nominated Jamie. Uh, by filling out the form at this URL, uh, tinyurl.com slash cr20live feature teacher nominate without the E at the end. And I believe the form, at least the link to the form, is also in the live binder. And each month, normally, there's a feature teacher. When you exit the show today, your browser should open the Classroom 2.0 Live survey. Um, if it doesn't, you can take the link in the chat box or the link from the Live Finder as well. At the bottom of that survey, you can request a professional development certificate. Please, though, when you make that request, you use a personal email address rather than a school email address because school emails tend to block this from getting back into your inbox. And of course, make sure you spell your address correctly. The archives are available in video and audio format at iTunes U, so you can access archives while mobile. And in addition to that, you can get an RSS feed of the show archives from the Classroom 2.0 Live website, which is a Weebly website. Again, special thanks to Jamie Reynolds, our special guest, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our website, and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>